Hello, welcome back. Um, so if you're here with me, it means you, you probably plan on following the pandemic over the course of the summer. Um, I'm going to be doing it myself anyway because I kind of like to know what's happening and to be able to plan for the future. Um, so um, as we collect more and more data, we'll be able to make better and better predictions about what might happen come September. So right now we're pretty early on um, in uh, collecting data. And so predicting all the way out to September or maybe you know, all the way up to uh, through December is, is, is a bit of a stretch. Um, as we have more and more data, we can make better and better predictions. Um, so the last time we talked, we had two main models. One assumed there was 1% fatality rate and the other assumed there was a half of a percent fatality rate. And if you downloaded the models, you saw I also ran it with a quarter of a percent. And the outcome of these three models are very, very different. And it's important to understand we don't know which of those models might be correct right now. Um, any one of them could be right or something entirely different. Um, so we need to sort of be able to prepare for any one of those cases. Um, and the reason why we don't know what model we're on is we have no idea how many people have actually been sick. There is not a good antibody test yet um, that will be specific for COVID-19. Um, you can take antibody tests, which would tell, tell you you haven't had any COVID-related kind of viruses, um, but you don't, if you turn up positive on those tests, you don't know that it was specifically COVID-19, um, but they may come up with better tests, and then we'll have a better sense of how many people actually have been sick. Um, so, so without knowing how many have been sick, you don't know the true percentage of fatalities. Um, so let's explore the three models that we have. And as we collect more and more data, we'll probably see which of those is more reasonable. Okay, so here's our 1% model. Um, let me clear um, the figure and let me run it again. So what I'm running first here is um, I'm, I'm running this to see uh, on the graph where we show the deaths versus time. And um, we want to see if we're actually fitting the data that we have. So, so far, um, I have data out to, let's see, where's my uh, array here? Okay, we have numbers out to 22 weeks. So, remember, we started collecting data for week 11. Um, you know, so we're just over, um, we have just over 10 weeks worth of data. And I've scaled the graph so that the purple uh, stars, the, the data, uh, fit nicely in there. Um, and you can see that I was able to fit a pretty good um, curve to that data by, as we talked about before, having variable um, matrix of A values, the transmission coefficient value. Um, so A had started very high, um, and you can see looking at these numbers that um, by week you know, 12, I start to bring it down, and I bring it down a lot further in week 13 and 14, because when we started the, the lockdown, it wasn't an immediate closed door. Um, it happened over a couple of weeks um, where things were, became tighter and tighter. And um, then we're going to start loosening up after week 20. All right. But remember, there's about a two week delay from between loosening up and actually um, maybe even a three week delay between loosening up and that resulting in fatalities. Um, so the numbers in these first two rows are the numbers that I um, carefully adjusted um, in order to match the data up to about week 22. So after that, um, we're just speculating, okay? But it's pretty safe to say that we are no longer down here at a very low transmission um, coefficient like we were in week 17. So we're loosening up the numbers and my model just has the numbers growing slowly and steadily, um, but we're trying to stay under our threshold where we'll crash the medical system. And so let's look at the whole graph now. So I will go to plot choice six, and let me show 110%. So 1.1 is Y max. Let's see what happens over, say, 60 weeks, a little longer than a year. And let's look at the whole thing. Okay, so when we look at the graph here, we can see um, you know, that the number of susceptible people is dropping steadily over the course of the year. Remember the shaded region is the uh, region where we don't yet know what's going to happen. That's where we're speculating. Um, the white region to the left is uh, where we had data for the deaths. 
Um, so we'll kind of assume that what's to the left is probably pretty accurate, and then we're going to be speculating from there. Now it's accurate with the assumption that 1% of cases ended in death. Um, so as we look at that, we can see you know, how the purple, the magenta line is how many people have become immune from, they are recovered from being sick. Um, and um, we can't see the other lines too well, okay? But let's see, where we are right now is week 22. Um, and remember, we're taking about 100 time steps per week. So let's see what the R of 2200 is. Well, let's go 2201 because technically the first point needs to be counted in there. So at week 22, where we are right now, this tells us that about 13% of the population um, has, in fact, already become immune. Okay, but that's still pretty low. That means 87% are not immune. So most people can still get sick. So this thing could keep going for a while. And now let's zoom in on the infection curve. So I'm going to re-plot this um, with y max equal to, let's just go up to 0.088%. And we can see our first wave. Um, it looks like if our assumption about fatalities was right, you know, about two and a half percent were uh, sick at the peak of the first wave, but we'll have a second wave um, that's even larger than the first wave. Now it looks like our second wave is actually going to crash the hospitals. So in order to deal with that, we should probably bring some of these later A values down. All right. So that would tell the government they need to open up the economy a little bit more slowly. Um, so it looks like, you know, probably around week 30, um, when we really started to open up in here, um, we need to probably keep it down a little bit lower. So certainly by week 36, we shouldn't be going up to a 1.5, maybe we'll, let's change that to a 1.4. And then at week uh, 42, um, let's see, we're going up to a two. Let's keep that down at a 1.5, all right. And uh, we'll only go up to a two at um, week 46. And let's see what happens there. So if we run it now, we won't crash the system. Um, and it looks like probably what we did at week 46 didn't really matter because we were already over the peak of the curve. Let's bump that back up to a three, which would be pretty much everybody can do everything. So in that scenario, we have to open up very slowly. Um, in order to keep people um, alive, okay, um, because we do not want to go over that data, dotted uh, red line because we'll crash the system. Okay, so these numbers all the way through up until about week 41, even in week 41, we're keeping our numbers well below two, so we're being relatively cautious. That means no, you know, football fans in the stadium, um, you know, because we're, we have to be cautious until about week 45 or so, and then we can really open up um, because by then um, the number of susceptible people will not be that high. In fact, we can see if we figure out how many people have been removed by 40 weeks in, um, by then it's still only 42% of the population at 40 weeks in. So um, a lot of people um, would, were still susceptible, but you know, it's, um, it's getting a lot better. We can open up more um, by the time we get to week 40. Um, that's kind of that peak of the second wave. If we totally open up, we might have a, a little third wave in there um, around Christmas time, that would look like, okay? That'd be the end of the year. Now let's switch to the 5% model. Oh, and, and in this model, let's uh, see how many people using these numbers I kept below the hospital threshold. Um, but if we look at the maximum death proportion, it's about 8 point, I'm sorry, about 0.88 percent of the population, okay? So if I take that answer times 9 million, we can see that's 79,000 people. So to put that in perspective, right now we're at around 12,000. Um, so that would be, oh, more than, let's see, so about six times as many people, I believe, um, will, will die as have died now. So that would be a pretty bad case, all right? In fact, the government might keep us locked down more um, to avoid having that many cases, and they might keep us locked down until we have a vaccine, all right? So um, that would not be a great case. Um, let's look at the 5% uh, case. Let me just pause for a second here.
Oops, I think I forgot to pause the video. Let me make sure I'm actually recording. Yes, I'm recording. So let me switch to the 5% case. Okay, so this will get better, okay? Um, because only 5% of people who become ill um, will end up um, dying from it, okay? So I think I have this already set up to look at the deaths and show how we match the data. Okay, so you can see we, by picking the A values that I have, up to about week 20, 21, um, we can match the data for the deaths uh, very well. Okay, so then after that, we're sort of speculating what these A values might be, um, but they're picked so that we stay below um, the threshold for illness where we would crash the medical system. So let's um, look at what happens overall with the 5% case. So if we go to plot choice six, and let's look at the full scale, 110%. And let's look at 60 weeks worth of results. Okay, there we have it, okay? Um, this is what our model would predict, okay? Um, so let's see how many people will have become immune by week 22. Okay, it looks like 27% of the population. Okay, so remember last time it was about 13%. Um, so we've just, you know, we've about doubled um, the percentage of people who are presently immune, all right? That has big consequences. Um, you can see the susceptible population has dropped a lot during the first wave. That's a steep drop there. Um, we had a lot of susceptible people no longer uh, remain susceptible. So we've used up uh, you know, about a quarter of the people who could get sick at this point. So there are a lot fewer who could get sick, all right? So let's look at the infection curve over this time period. So I think I wanna go down to about 10% um, or about that. We'll go to 8% again. I think that's where we were. Uh, that looks pretty good. Okay, so focus on the red line. If we look at the infection curve, um, this probably gets us a little too close to the hospital threshold early on. Um, I probably need to raise that a little bit because we never crashed our hospital system, although we got pretty close. Okay, so I'm going to raise the initial amount. Actually, I'm going to keep that at 0.05, but I'm going to assume that we could serve another 4% of the population a year later. Let's see if that, that's probably more realistic. Okay, so we're staying well below um, the threshold um, of what hospitals can handle. Um, for the second wave, and it dies off relatively nicely. Now, remember, all of these A values are speculation, all right? Um, but you can see there's the nice thing here is if this is our case, our A values are going up very steadily, 1.4, two weeks later, 1.6, two weeks later, 1.8, all right? So then we're at 2, 2.2. So I continually raise um, the coefficient for infection um, or transmission, I should say. Um, so I continually raise that and we still have better results than we had in the 1% model. Okay, so this could be more reflective of what's happening now where the governor is allowing us to you know, use swimming pools in a couple of weeks and you know, the, every, every week something else is allowed. Um, the protests are hard to, you know, we may have had a spike in what the A value is um, during this period of unrest, it's, it's hard to say how that will affect the data. Um, so we may have some A values that are pretty high for a while. Hopefully um, social unrest will dissipate and that could help bring A down a little bit. Um, but the, the optimistic thing is where there's a steady opening and um, the results in the end are much better. If we look at the maximum number of deaths after, uh, so that would be at 60 weeks roughly, um, we're down at 0.48%, just below the half percent. And if we take that answer whoops, and multiply by 9 million people roughly in New Jersey, um, we'd be looking at 43,000 deaths. All right. So, um, you know, that's at least triple the number of deaths we have right now, um, but it's not um, nearly as bad as the other case. The other case would have had about double that number of deaths. Um, so, this is definitely better. Um, than we had looked at before. 
okay? Um, so remember, this is a very low percentage of deaths. It's less than half a percent of the population, but that is a lot of people, okay? So um, we don't want, now it'd be nice not to have to go that high, um, but that could be how things can play out. And, and something very important to note is that second peak is not quite as high with the numbers that I put in. It's not quite as high as the first peak, all right? And when is that peak happening? It looks like um, it's about week 35. And uh, where would we're at week 35? That's 35 out of 52 in a year. That's 67% of the way through 12 months. So take the answer times 12. Okay, now we have to add one to that. So that's um, right about the beginning of September, okay? Um, because January isn't the zero with month. January 1st would happen at day zero or week zero in our chart. Um, so we really need to add one to the month count. So that's about the beginning of September when we would hit that peak. So we would see, um, you know, where we'd be approaching this low point and we would be climbing this peak. And um, the worst of it would be, you know, right around the opening of, of school. Okay, well, college is open a little before that. Um, so, and remember, this is for New Jersey. So um, we have a second wave that's not quite as bad as the first. We have better hospital capacity. We're much better prepared. Um, and then soon after the beginning of the school year, things would really drop off, even though we continue to raise the A value. So in this model, I never drop the A value. The government might add some restrictions as we're going up this steep part, so the A value may be lower, um, but once again, that would mean we be able to do fewer things, or perhaps we just have a lot better contact tracing. So we can do more things because we can catch the people who are sick right away. Moving along, um, let's look at that last case. This is the quarter of a percent case. As you can see, if the half percent got better, a quarter percent should get even better than that. Um, as long as we don't crash the hospitals, it means we can't have more than a quarter of a percent of fatalities. Um, so let's run this first to show that we're matching the data. Okay. Um, oh, I need to do this on plot choice five. Let's see. So plot choice five, um, let's make Y max very small, 0 0.002, let's say. And let's um, go out to just 25 weeks and let's see how we're matching the data. Okay, so you can see, once again, I, I have adjusted the A values, um, so we match the data very nicely um, up to the data that we have at present. Um, so I filled those in in the matrix, and you can see, once again, I actually am raising A exactly the way that I did um, before, where every two weeks I'm raising it by 0.2 but we'll see the results of that are much better. Um, we won't go nearly as close toward the hospital threshold. Um, so let me run this again on plot choice six. Let me go out to 110%. Okay, so plot choice six shows everything and let's go out to 60 weeks and run and look at this. Okay, now we can see there might be a problem here. We know that we didn't actually crash the um, hospital threshold. Okay, we came close, um, but I need to raise this red line a little bit. So let's zoom in a little bit at, um, to look at the red curve. And so I'm gonna go up to uh, 0 0.1, oh, 0 0.1 and plot this again. Let's see my cursor, there we go. All right, so we need that initial threshold um, to be up above the first peak, we know that the first wave didn't actually crash the system. Um, so we need to make I threshold initial more than 0.07. Um, in fact, we could probably make that about 0 0.10 and we probably can make the slope of it steeper, um, should be steeper than the last example and the initial amount should be higher. And let's see, that's off of the graph now. So I better make T Y max, let's go uh, 0.15. And let's see what that looks like. Okay, now that looks better. So looking at this, what you can see is the first wave actually had a large percentage of the population. Nearly 10% of the population was sick all at once, according to this model. Okay, somewhere around week 15. 
Um, so a large percent got sick all at once, much larger than um, was believed to be the case, all right? And if a lot of people got sick early on, there are fewer people left to get sick later. So if we look back at this um, at a larger scale, whoops, let me zoom out and let's look at everything full scale. Okay, you can see how much the blue curve has dropped, all right? So if a lot of people were infected in the first wave, then that means we're, we're, we'd be in better shape. The number who have recovered by now, so that's 2201, time step 2201, the 22nd week, would be 45% of the population, okay? So right, we're approaching 50% of the population um, would have already been, um, is already immune, all right? So then as we open up, there are only half as many people who are susceptible to getting sick. Um, and so that does good things to the mathematics. In fact, um, let me just highlight something. I'm gonna switch over to my iPad in a moment. Um, but mathematically, um, even though we keep raising the A values just like we did for the half a percent case, in fact, we raise them um, higher in the end, we really don't get much of a second wave at all. Okay, so that would mean, you know, we're going to dip down and just sort of hold steady on the number of infections. Um, let me actually blow up on that. So about 0.15. And so if we continue to relax um, the social distancing standards and we don't see a rise in, of infections, we might actually be in a model that looks like this 0.25% uh, case. Um, and we would expect we'd have hardly any rise in infections when school starts. And you can see that, you know, by week 35, that'll be right about in here. That's when school will be starting. Um, we're really not doing anything at all. Okay. Um, by the time the A value gets to three, um, there would be very few things that we would be restricting. Um, perhaps we wouldn't allow people to go to movie theaters, but maybe that would be the last, um, you know, one of the last things to open up. Um, just about everything else would be fair game. You know, maybe football stadiums wouldn't open up yet, um, but we would certainly not have to really do anything special at school, maybe not even have to wear masks. Um, so that would be the hopeful case. Okay, so uh, let me just end with some final thoughts and sketching some things on the iPad just to show you why this works the way it does. Um, the key is the susceptible, how many people are really susceptible still? Okay, so in this last model, Ha only half of the population is still susceptible in the end, whereas in the first model, um, I think it was about 87% or at least 83% were still susceptible, and that makes a big difference. Okay, so the big equation that um, all of this is affected by is that, remember that the rate at which people become infected, DIDT, is given by a, that transmission coefficient that we talked about, times I times S, the product of those three things, all right? So um, the, if there are more people infected, they can spread the, the virus more quickly, um, but they can only spread it to susceptible people. So really, these two things should be linked together. So this equals, I'm going to put this in parentheses and group those, A times S times I. So what's happening is the susceptible population is always going down, all right? And so if the susceptible population is always dropping, um, the, the combination, you could either raise A and keep the infection rate the same. That's kind of what we're doing as we open up the economy. S is certainly smaller now than it was at the beginning of all of this. So we can raise A, higher A values will have you know, no more effect um, than lower A values used to have. Um, so we can allow more things to happen, all right? Um, as S gets really small, so when S really goes down far, um, we can just crank that A value up and the infection rate will not really increase, okay? Um, so I think I heard in the governor's news report that they believe that the transmission rate is 0.8, all right? I don't believe that that means A is 0.8. I think that it means that if we took 0.8 times I, it would match what they're determining DIDT is right now, okay? So I think that's the product of A times S, all right? So we don't know what A is exactly without knowing what S is exactly, 
Um, and so we're kind of guessing which of these models might be right. Okay, I'm hopeful um, that the last model that I showed you is the correct one um, because that bodes very well um, for the end of summer in the beginning of the school year. Um, you know, but let's not assume that that's the case. Let's see what happens with the data. Um, so over the next week, um, read the news. Let's try to determine what kinds of things um, we should adjust in our model to get it to match the data.